Now, let me, let me give you an introduction to the Middle Ages, and then I'll show you what we're going to do next week. I know we've been here for two hours and 45 minutes, but think of all the money you're paying for this, and so we're going to give you your money's worth. I'm going to draw a kind of timeline on the board, and I'm going to identify several ranks of thinkers who may be part of our future. Okay? In other words, let's not put any dates on this timeline yet. But let's distinguish between first rank thinkers and second rank thinkers. Who are the biggies that we're going to be studying for the next few weeks? Who belongs to the second rank of thinkers and maybe who belongs to the a, a third rank? Well, I don't think there's any question but that the biggies would include Augustine and Aquinas. Let's put Aquinas over here. And then, because we're not going to take this past, um, uh, we're not going to take this timeline past the 16th century, uh, let's put Luther and Calvin over here. And uh, I almost think uh, I almost think we have to insert Descartes here as well. I don't know, that's questionable. Descartes, it depend, a, lot, a lot depends on how you read him. All right, but let's, let's treat Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, and Calvin as the four most important thinkers, this is my judgment, of the period of time between 400 A.D. and, say, 1600 A.D., now we've got a number of second-rank thinkers. I don't mean to cast dispersions on these people, but right after, a century after Augustine, there's a man named Boethius. Let me write his name bigger so you can see it in the back of the room. I think Boethius died uh, around 527 A.D. He's a Roman. I'm not sure I'm going to say anything about Boethius because time is running out here, but certainly here's an, here is a man who's the last Roman and the first citizen of the Middle Ages, as some people say. And then before Aquinas, we have uh, two other thinkers. We have Anselm. Anselm, I'll think of him as around 1105 A.D., He's a man who discovered a very important and influential argument for the existence of God. And then we've also got St. Bonaventure. I'm, not, I'm going to say a little bit about Anselm. I'm not sure what I'll be able to say about Bonaventure. He lived, his life almost uh, overlapped that of Aquinas. Then we've got, uh, in the late Middle Ages, Duns Scotus. Um, from which we get, incidentally, the word dunce. Uh, I'm not sure I could reconstruct how we get from Duns Scotus to dunce, but we do. And then we get William of Ockham. And then there are some, uh, these would be your, your second line thinkers. And then the third line thinkers, in here you get a man named Abelard. Can any of you recall his sweetheart's name? Abelard and Eloise, two of the great lovers of history. The fact that Abelard was a priest <laughs> didn't seem to have anything to do with that. Um, Abelard and Eloise. Um, I was walking through a cemetery in Paris ten years ago or so. I guess I was there to, to find their, their, they're buried side by side. It's very romantic. Um, if any of you get to Paris and you want to know where that cemetery is and you want to take flowers to the grave of Abelard and Eloise, I'll tell you where it is. There's also a man in here, John Scotus Erigena, who's an important medieval thinker, but we're not going to talk about John Scotus Erigena at all. He, he's dated about 1100 A.D. And then, and I realize my chart is getting a little complicated to see, there are two important Muslim philosophers. Hmm? 
Avero, Averroese and Avicenna. Now they come, they come a century or two before Aquinas. Let's just put their names up here. Avicenna and Averroes. I hope I pronounce Averroes' name correctly. Even though Averroes is a, is a, belongs to the, what I'm calling here the third rank, I am going to be talking about him because I've discovered you can't really make sense out of what Aquinas was trying to do in the 13th century unless you place the work of Aquinas against the backdrop of all of the, of all of the turmoil and the conflict that was coming out of the Muslim world at that time. Now, in order to cover 850 years, a number of thinkers uh, who might, in a different kind of course, be important enough to, to merit perhaps even an entire period uh, are going to have to um, be mentioned in just um, uh, a, a sweeping glance. And so I will begin by uh, reminding you where we left off with St. Augustine and then I will quickly mention three secondary thinkers of the next five or six hundred years uh, and then we'll pause for a little longer and take a serious look at perhaps the most important Christian thinker uh, of the Middle Ages between Augustine and Aquinas, and that would be St. Anselm. Now, last week, as you'll recall, uh, we noted that St. Augustine died in 430 A.D. The Roman Empire was collapsing. Augustine's own uh, city of Hippo Regius was besieged by, uh, by uh, barbarians from uh, Germanic tribes that had invaded North Africa and had swept across North Africa. And Augustine's death uh, saved him from the agony of, of seeing these people uh, uh, enter the walls of Hippo Regius and, uh, and uh, wreak havoc upon it. Now, in the, in the centuries following Aquinas, as you know, all kinds of terrible things happened to the Western world. Uh, uh, and those are, those are things that uh, you'll have, uh, that's information that you'll have to get from your history courses and from your church history courses. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Farrell will uh, or e either has already or will soon be filling you in on what happens to the Christian church in the 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. The, the three thinkers whom I'm going to mention very briefly before we get to Anselm are, first of all, Boethius, who lived from 480 to, let's say, 525. A.D. It's uncertain whether he died in 25 or 524. The second thinker we'll mention briefly is John Scotus Ariagena. John Scotus. And incidentally, the word Scot in the Middle Ages was a way of referring to an Irishman. And so uh, John the Scot here John Scotus Ariagena was really an Irishman at, by birth, and his dates, and notice the, the jump, 810 to 877 A.D., in other words, to find the next really significant philosopher after Boethius, we have to go 300 years into the, we, have to, we have to traverse a period of time of 300 years. And then the last of these thinkers that we're going to mention very briefly, and if I spend more than five minutes on any of them, I'm in trouble, it will be um, Abelard, the close friend of Eloise, whose life uh, traverses the years 1079 to 1142 A.D. 
First of all, Boethius. There's some question whether Boethius was a Christian or not. Uh, that question is raised because in his major work, The Consolation of Philosophy, which incidentally is one of those philosophy books that just about anybody can understand and appreciate. It's often, it's often included as required reading in world literature courses. Uh, but in his Consolation of Philosophy, there is no clear affirmation of any kind that would enable us to clearly identify Boethius as a Christian. But anyway, tradition tells us that he was. Um, his, he finally died. Uh, he wrote the Consolation of Philosophy, incidentally, while in prison, uh, uncertain what the outcome of his imprisonment would be. Uh, that outcome was simply that he was executed uh, uh, under the charge of high treason. Boethius is sometimes called the last Roman and the first schoolman. The word, school, the word schoolman referring, I guess, <coughs> uh, to the fact that he was, he perhaps could be regarded as the first thinker of the Middle Ages, and he was certainly the last uh, Roman uh, thinker of any merit. Now, Boethius is important in the history of thought for a couple of reasons, which we're going to skim over very quickly. First of all, he's the major source, uh, he's the major individual through whom Aristotelianism was transmitted to the Middle Ages. As I will indicate later on today, Aristotelianism became, uh, uh, became uh, unknown to a great extent, at least to an accurate extent, as the Middle Ages progressed. But whatever presence of Aristotle there was during the early Middle Ages is certainly due to Boethius. He talks about the form matter doctrine. He talks about the ten categories. He talks about a number of other elements of Aristotelian philosophy. He even talks about God as the unmoved mover. A second reason why Boethius is important is because he also transmitted what we call the problem of universals to the Middle Ages. Now, depending upon how much time I give it in a few minutes, uh, one of the major controversies during Abelard's lifetime was a serious philosophical and theological dispute about the status of what you now, now know as, as universals, Plato's forms. Well, for reasons that I'm not going to go into here, and in ways that I'm not going to uh, take the time to mention, Boethius is the fellow who really conveyed or transmitted that, that discussion to the Middle Ages. The third and the last reason for Boethius' significance that I'll mention is this. He perhaps presented the first uh, clear uh, formulation of what has become a fairly influential uh, Christian theory. And that Christian theory is an, is an attempt to answer the question, how can we reconcile divine knowledge of the future, divine foreknowledge, with human freedom? Now, some of you in this class were in my apologetics class yesterday when we talked about this. Uh, and if some of you have not yet taken the apologetics class, we'll perhaps take it next year. We'll talk about that problem in more detail in the apologetics class. But you see, there is a problem. If God knows which, what decisions human beings are going to make in the future, it does appear as though God's foreknowledge makes those human decisions necessary. Now, the particular answer to that problem that Boethius developed and then transmitted to the Middle Ages is based upon a particular understanding of God's relationship to time. What Boethius did, and here he was really following some suggestions in Augustine, Augustine suggests, or Boethius suggested that God is timeless. That is, he exists totally removed from time as we know it. Hence, there is no past for God, there is no future for God, Everything that exists occurs within God's eternal present. Ooh, 
<laughs> Boy, when I'm preaching away and the lights uh, glimmer like that, it makes me wonder if I'm saying the right thing. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Is that a note of approval or, or disapproval there? Um, in other words, and I'll use an example that I used in yesterday's class. Notice right now that I am pulling my right earlobe. I could, if I wished, pull my left earlobe, but let's pull the right earlobe. Now, you all are capable of observing right now in the present what I'm doing, but your observation your awareness, your perception of what I am doing hardly causes my behavior, does it? You are simply perceiving, you are simply uh, uh, cognizant of something that is going on in the present. There's no causal connection between what you perceive and what I do. Well, that analogy is, is the one that underlies the timelessness solution to the, to the problem of divine foreknowledge and human freedom. If God's knowledge of the free choices that human beings are going to make in the future is similar to, the, to your awareness of something I do in the present, then there is no causal connection in God's case any more than there is any causal connection in your case, you see? God's foreknowledge on this view does not cause nor does it necessitate, nor does it determine what human beings freely do in the future. That was Boethius's answer. I'm not going to say any more about that theory here because it, it properly belongs, I think, to some other courses. If any of you are curious enough that you want to pursue it a little further, there is a chapter, in fact, there are two chapters on this problem in, uh, in my little book called The Concept of God which is in the bookstore and which Frank Jones would love <laughs> to see some of you remove from his shelf. Uh, there's a chapter in that book on divine timelessness, and incidentally, there are some problems. There are some serious problems with viewing God as a timeless being. And, uh, and thus, it's not entirely uh, certain that the kind of approach that Boethius takes here is going to work. Later on in the history of medieval philosophy, the same kind of answer to this problem will be given by St. Anselm in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries and by Thomas Aquinas and by lots of people in our own day. Yes? So long as you just said, incidentally, I ran across this last night in C.S. Lewis's Scrooge, which refers to both and explains I'm glad you mentioned C.S. Lewis. Listen. Lewis was not only a teacher, a professor of medieval literature, he was well grounded in medieval philosophy and medieval theology. I guess you'd expect that from someone who t teaches the literature. Now that's important for this, uh, for this reason. When we get to Aquinas, hopefully before today is over, a lot of the stuff that we'll encounter in Thomas Aquinas appears all over C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. A, a kind of Thomistic moral philosophy pervades the middle of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. And uh, the theory of the moral law that plays such an important role in the first 50 pages of Mere Christianity is, is strongly influenced by Thomas Aquinas. So keep that in mind. So much for Boethius. That's all the time we can give him even less time to John Scotus Ariagena. Somebody has said that uh, Ariagena's philosophy was one of the most remarkable phenomena of the ninth century. <laughs> well, I don't know how significant a compliment that is because frankly, I can't think of much that happened in the ninth century that's very important, all right? Uh, who knows? Maybe the 20th century will end up so dull that people may even refer to my philosophy as one of the significant accomplishments <laughs> of the 20th century. You never know. Anyway, uh, these, these are faint words of praise. Uh, Eregina was born in Ireland. He studied in an Irish monastery, and then he moved to France. And the reason I mention his move to France is because, get this, during the reign of my 
favorite French king, Charles the Bald, <laughs> Ooh, John Scotus assumed an important position in the Palatine School. I've always liked the name Charles the Bald. It sort of, I guess, sets a precedent that maybe my biographer can follow, all right? Ronald the Bald or something. Now, with all of that triviality aside, there is one major reason why Eregina is important, and that is he did develop an impressive, a remarkable philosophical and theological system. Unfortunately, it's also terribly ambiguous, uh, it's difficult to understand, but what does come across is the powerful influence of Neoplatonism on John Scotus Ariagena. That's what I want you to remember in connection with this guy. The philosophical system that he developed uh, that was supposed to be a Christian system was actually not Christian at all. And those of you who will remember your Plotinus in the years to come and who will remember your Neoplatonism in the years to come, if you ever, if you ever do any study of Erigena, you'll see Plotinus and Neoplatonism all over the place. And, the, and the, perhaps the, the, the important bottom line here is that Scotus's view of God turns out to be pantheistic. There is more than a hint that John Scotus Eregina never did justice to the transcendence of God and thus blurred the distinction between God and the world, which of course is the fatal error of all pantheists. So it then turns out to be very disappointing that this man who is often called the greatest Christian thinker of the ninth century turns out to be a pantheist and a heretic and all kinds of other things. Peter Abelard may very well be, well, uh, he's certainly one of the two most important Christian thinkers during, uh, well, what should we say, the 12th century? Maybe that's a little bit too, uh, a little bit too strong. I will not here go into the romance, the tragic romance between Peter Abelard and his sweetheart Eloise, although if any of you have any streak of romanticism in you, it will move you to tears. You know, uh, Abelard was a priest and Eloise was the uh, daughter of rich and powerful and wealthy family and uh, their romance came to a bad end and Eloise entered a nunnery and so on. And as I said last week, uh, today their bodies lie side by side in a Paris cemetery and uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the particular, uh, I, I can't think of the, uh, the, the stone structure that exists over their bodies uh, has the form of a, of a canopy bed. It's very romantic. I remember that when I visited uh, their grave back in 1977, I guess I shed a tear or two for Abelard and Eloise. They were actually buried in separate cemeteries, <laughs> but the guy who owned this particular cemetery in Paris thought that uh, <clears throat> he might get uh, more tourists to visit his cemetery if he would have their bodies dug up and brought together and have them reunited in death. Well, we're not here to talk about, uh, talk about the love affair of Father Abelard. We're here to talk about his philosophy and... Uh, Actually, there are some, there, there's enough in Abelard that could, under other occasions, keep us entertained for an hour or two. I want to simply use him as a way to draw your attention to one of the most famous controversies in medieval philosophy, and that is the problem of universals. Back in the old days, when I used to teach an entire course on medieval philosophy, I always dreaded this particular subject. There's no way you can do justice to medieval philosophy without talking about the problem of universals, but it is without question the most boring, deadly dull discussion 
that you can encounter in any philosophy class. But let's just, let's just mention a thing or two about it. By this particular time in the history of Christianity, several positions have become solidified in certain teachers. And what's interesting is that these positions relating to the problem of universals became identified with people all of whom taught Abelard at one time or another. For example, let's put this up here where you all can see it. One of Abelard's teachers was a man named Rosalind. Now Rosalind appears to have been appears to have been the, a representative of a position called nominalism. Now I mentioned nominalism the week after uh, you all took your test. This is a this is a position regarding Plato's forms, which in effect says that both Plato and Aristotle were wrong. Nominalism is the belief that universals do not exist. There is no such thing as the form man or the form or the universal of justice or truth or beauty. Both Plato and Aristotle were wrong. Forms do not exist. Well, what are they then? Well, the Latin word nomen, from which we get nominalism, the Latin word nomen uh, is, the, is the word for uh, word. And hence, nominalists like Rosalind were thought to have taught that universals are simply empty words. Simply empty words. The only things that really exist, here's the key to nominalism, the only things that really exist for a nominalist are particular things. Particular chairs exist, but there is no such thing as the universal or the form, deskness. Particular dogs exist, but there is no universal. This property or essence of dogginess that Plato and Aristotle talked about is just an empty word. That's all it is. Well, Rosalind might have gotten away with that, except his position got tied in with the theory, the doctrine of the Trinity. And that proved to be Rosalind's Achilles heel. In other words, people could overlook his nominalism as long, he was, as long as he was talking about trees and rocks and so on. But as soon as people began to sense that Rosalind's nominalism entailed heresy with regard to the Trinity, he was in real trouble. And the guy who identified the heresy to which Rosalind's nominalism led was his former pupil, Abelard. Now here's how nominalism in, in this controversy supposedly led to uh, heresy. You see, Christians believe that the word God, the word God, denotes an essence that is participated fully in by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that in the doctrine of the Trinity, you have three particulars, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, sharing in one universal essence. Now, as, as this debate during the Middle Ages developed, somebody pointed out that if the word God isn't a universal, even if it does not denote a common property or something shared equally, by the three particulars, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then Rosalind's theory implies tritheism. You see, you can't have the Father as God and the Son as God and the Holy Spirit as God as participating in the same essence. Hence, 
The Father is one God, the Son is a second God, and the Holy Spirit is a third. There are three gods. Well, that's heresy. Tradition tells us that when this was pointed out to Rosalind, he muttered, oops, <laughs> and disappeared, disappeared from the scene. You know, he went into a monastery somewhere and um, was never heard from again. Well, Abelard had another teacher. I, this kind of a, this would make a great TV movie of the week, I think. Uh, you know, the first two-hour episode, we have Abelard studying under Rosalyn, and then he destroys at Rosalyn. Then he studies under another guy named William of Champeaux. Now, William of Champeaux held to a position that was the exact opposite of Rosalind, or at least that's what Abelard would have us believe. You have to remember that in all of this controversy, all that we know really comes from Abelard. It's, his is the only account of this controversy that we have to go by. And so if there's the least bit of stereotyping going on, the least bit of misrepresenting going on, we could be doing a great injustice to Rosalind and to William of Champeaux. Well, William of Champeaux's position on universals is called realism. Now, the word realism in the history of philosophy assumes many meanings. In this context, a realist is simply a person who believes that what Plato and Aristotle called forms really do exist apart from particular things. They really exist apart from particular things. Hence, realism. All right? Now, let me admit to you that I, on this controversy, I am a realist. I am not a nominalist. I'm a realist. I believe that there really are things called uh, these universals really exist and they really exist apart from the particular things that exemplify them but William of Champeaux wasn't just content to be a realist he was what we call uh oh a hyper realist as in hyper fundamentalist hyper dispensationalist hyper liberal you know somebody who's hyper takes a position that might make sense in some kind of moderate expression and he carries it to some kind of fanatical extreme well what William of Champeau apparently did was this he exalted the universal so much that he appears to have denied the reality of particular things Now, I'll repeat that. I'm not sure this, it'll, be any, it'll make any more sense the second time than it did the first. But this hyper, this ultra-realist, so exaggerated the universal that he tended to deny the existence of the particular things that exemplify the universal. Remember back near the beginning of the course when we were talking about Plato and we mentioned the difference between the members of a set and the common properties that define the nature of the set, those common properties that the members of a set must possess. Well, what William apparently did was this. He said the only thing that's really real is the set, and the members of the set aren't real at all. Now, when this was applied to the Trinity, William of Champeaux got convicted of heresy, but the different, a different kind of heresy. Remember, the doctrine of the Trinity says that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three eternal centers of consciousness that share the same eternal divine essence. Well, what William Ashampo did in the case of the universal man was this. He tended to exalt the existence of the universal man, and he tended to deny the reality of individual people like you and me in the case of the Godhead he exalted the divine essence and he tended to downplay the reality 
of the, uh, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so, Rosalind's heresy was tritheism. William of Champeau's heresy was Unitarianism. You see? He tended to deny the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three eternal uh, centers of consciousness uh, sharing equally in the Godhead. Well, Abelard, let's, let's make this story short. Let's draw it to a close. What Abelard did was this. He sought a middle ground between these two extremes. And it turns out that his mediating position on the problem of universals was Aristotle's view. Abelard becomes Aristotle's first significant spokesman in the Christian world at this particular time in history. Now the name that we usually give to Aristotle's position is moderate realism. I hope you can see my writing here. In other words, Abelard said, as Aristotle had said before him, universals do exist, but they only exist in particular things, as, their, as the form or the essence of particular things. And that's the extent of what I'm going to tell you about uh, Abelard. Uh, as you read through Clark, and I do hope that you will read Clark, you'll find Clark giving you uh, four to five pages on Boethius, four to five pages on uh, uh, John Scotus, and uh, several pages on the uh, controversy over universals. Let me end my discussion of Abelard with one good quotation from the guy, all right? This is a quotation worth remembering. I don't know that you'll find it in Clark. But Abelard was, for all of his, <laughs> for all of his moral problems, uh, and maybe he's a lot like all of us, all right? You find, you find problems, you find inconsistencies, you find paradoxes in the man. He was a man who wanted to be faithful to the Christian faith. And so he said, I do not wish to be a philosopher to the point of resisting Paul. I do not wish to be an Aristotelian to the point of being separated from Christ. So uh, that, something like that might be good instruction for all of us to follow. Would I repeat it? Yes. I do not wish to be a philosopher to the point of resisting Paul. I do not wish to be a philosopher to the point of resisting Paul. I do not wish to be an Aristotelian to the point of being separated from Christ. So I'll be an Aristotelian as long as I can, but when push comes to shove, let's remember that I'm a Christian and I'm not going to take my Aristotelianism down any paths that would result in my being separated from uh, Christ.